It's an immense pleasure and honor to have with us Professor Jeremy Gunavardhana from Harvard Medical School for this edition of Living Histories. Uh, Jeremy, please tell us about living very many different and interesting living histories. Um, Sri, thank you very much uh, for this unexpected invitation to um, uh, participate in what I think is really a very um, uh, useful and important idea um, to record something about the strange uh, trajectories that some of us um, take in uh, the course of becoming scientists. Um, and uh, um, in the instructions that you sent me, um, you uh, particularly wanted to bring out the sort of um, accidental and serendipitous um, nature of, um, of um, uh, one's uh, sort of personal course through life. And, uh, and I've always thought that that was very much um, a characteristic of my own life. Um, if, um, if I had known uh, if someone had told me back when I was a student that I would be um, uh, working in a biology department and um, and teaching courses in biology uh, and being passionately interested in it, I would probably have fallen off my chair laughing. Um, it it would have seemed um, completely um, ludicrous, actually. Um, so, which just goes to show how accidental one's trajectory can be even to oneself. Um, so um, where can I start? I'm, I, I'm a mathematician by upbringing. Um, I, I would say a pure mathematician and we can get into why I make that distinction <laughs> if that's really interesting. But um, uh, I still, I think, identify, if that's the right word, as a, as a pure mathematician, even though I'm a systems biologist. Um, and um, uh, my, um, uh, my um, route was uh, very unpredictable. I was fascinated by mathematics from an early age. Um, I, I particularly was drawn to the, um, the elegance and uh, power of pure mathematical thinking. Um, but I was also um, um, very interested in the idea that mathematics should be used in the real world and not just something that um, is hidden away in, in, in uh, spaces where only a small number of people sort of think about them. Um, so I always had a sort of tension in um, my own mind about the beauty of pure mathematics and, on the other hand, the necessity of applying it. Um, so. Um, I think the first place where that tension um, sort of emerged um, was um, after my PhD, uh, when I was um, um, doing a postdoc at Chicago. Um, and it, um, it turned out that um, in the year that I arrived in Chicago, the Department of Mathematics was, um, was tasked with um, creating uh, or starting up a, a sort of computer science initiative. Um, and their idea of how to do that was to hire um, some very good logicians um, who actually didn't know an awful lot about computer science. So I ended up teaching um, the first computer science classes uh, in the department um, in the sense of, you know, programming and, and things like that. I'd been playing with computers since I was a kid. And for me, it was just fun. Um, and I learned something which I've relearned several times since then that um, when you start teaching a subject, uh, that's when you really actually understand it. Um, and so the experience of teaching computing actually made me realize that there were re interesting scientific questions in computer science um, and, and the sort of questions that actually pure mathematicians might be drawn to. Um, and that um, uh, was the start of um, my fall from grace uh, to borrow Mark Katz's way of describing his own transition from pure mathematics. And um, um, uh, I became more and more interested in the questions of computer science. And actually, um, I really enjoyed the work I did in my thesis. But uh, subsequently, um, the direction that I was working in algebraic topology and the direction that the subject took 
made, was I found rather boring. And, and so the combination of those two um, actually led me out of academia um, to uh, Hewlett-Packard um, research labs. Um, and Hewlett-Packard had opened um, um, a, a major part of its research labs in, in Bristol in England. And that's where I started. And one of the things that was very interesting about Hewlett-Packard at the time um, was that they were uh, moving towards this idea of creating a research environment that um, was very forward-looking. Um, it was a sort of basic research environment. Um, the idea was to stimulate new business for the company, but uh, new ideas for new businesses. But it was also to um, uh, it, uh, it was also to draw on some of the things that had happened in organizations like AT&T with Bell Labs and IBM with Yorktown Heights. Um, so that was um, actually a very interesting uh, period of my life. I, I um, helped set up um, part of Hewlett Packard's basic research program. Um, and um, that uh, was what ultimately sparked the first interest in, in biology. As I said, um, uh, you know, I, I really uh, wasn't interested in biology. I mean, to, to put it in perspective, um, I think uh, biology was the second most boring subject I learned at school. I tried very hard not to learn anything, and I was very successful at that. So, um, so, so it was, um, uh, you know, this one of these strange kind of accidents that much later on, um, about the time that the genome projects were becoming um, news about them was sort of seeping out into the world and just before the human genome project was was successfully completed and it was clear that something very unusual and exciting was happening in biology that it was making a sort of transition from being a subject in which you had to be in the lab and do wet things with your hands to something where you could acquire biological insight um, through a computer um, it was going through this transition from um, entirely wet to partially dry and I thought in my capacity as sort of, you know, sort of dealing with sort of basic research at HP that this should be something of fundamental importance to a major computer company. Um, and uh, it was, um, uh, it was absolutely not at the time. Um, HP was going through a very difficult transition where the founders, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, who were very much around when I joined the company, uh, was, were really stepping away from the company. And that's a, that's a very traumatic period for any um, for any company and uh, essentially HP never recovered from it. It was never the same company afterwards. So nobody was interested in biology. Um, so I thought I would, um, I, I left HP and I, I was actually expecting to, to remain in the industrial world and, um, and pursue this direction of sort of the interplay between computer science and biology. Um, and then another one of those you know, completely random accidents happened. Um, I had um, got to know a lot of people in Boston through HP, and I had met Andrew Murray, who um, was professor of molecular biology at Harvard, and Andrew was setting up um, uh, a new uh, a genomics institute, the Bauer Center for Genomics Research at Harvard. And um, uh, when he knew what I was uh, sort of getting interested in, he, um, he said, well, look, come and, come and spend some time with us. We'll teach you some biology and you can show us how to recruit physicists and mathematicians into this new venture. Um, and um, it was too good an offer to turn down. So I said, well, why not? I, you know, I might actually learn something. Um, and that was a transformative event for me because um, one of the things that I came to understand as a result of, of, um, of joining the um, center was that, which, which I completely didn't understand before, is that um, um, biology is one of these subjects where um, uh, what you read about it in papers and books really doesn't tell you what's actually going on. Um, it, the only way to find that out is actually to be immersed in a biological world where all the hidden assumptions and culture and history and the reasons why people do the things they do, uh, which is almost essentially never discussed in papers and books, um, all of those things um, are revealed to you through a process of sort of acclimatization and osmosis, <coughs> implicit learning rather than explicit learning. Um, and as a result of this, um, 
uh, pretty much everything that I thought was interesting before I joined the Bow Center turned out to be wrong. Um, and I began to realize that there were, you know, sort of fundamental um, unanswered questions in biology that were really fascinating. Um, and uh, again, through one of these, I look back and I keep thinking, how did these accidents sort of happen at the time that they did? Um, it just so happened that at a time that I was there at Harvard as a visitor, um, the medical school was going through a sort of um, um, exercise of um, uh, creating and uh, deciding uh, uh, upon a new direction and a new department. Um, and, um, and, and this was the Department of Systems Biology. Um, and I was, became entrained in these conversations. And Mark Kirshner, who was the founding chair of the department, um, uh, offered me a job, um, uh, which was definitely not the trajectory that I thought I was on at the time. Um, and, um, um, and having gone through this experience of sort of seeing uh, what was uh, emerging in biology, um, I, I was uh, really delighted to, um, to accept this. And I, I remember having um, uh, another one of these experiences and, and, and realizations about the nature of biology um, was, um, you know, as a theorist, it was something that I found um, a, a little bit of a shock, which um, is that if you, if you, uh, if you want to, um, um, if you want to be credible to biologists, somebody has to do an experiment. It's the nature of the domain. And, um, and I had no um, um, collaborators or anyone like that that I could work with on an experimental basis. Um, and so I came to the ludicrous conclusion that I would have to do experiments myself. Um, and I remember having this conversation with Mark and imagining that I was having it with um, a head of department, a head of a biology department in England, or indeed anywhere on the continent of Europe and saying, I'm a pure mathematician, I have no um, background experience in, in experiment whatsoever, and I, and, and I think you should pay me to do experiments. Um, and I know exactly what the answer would have been. I would have been told to take an aspirin and, and um, you know, go and, and lie down, and I would feel better the next day. Um, and, um, and, and, and I had this conversation with Mark, and, he just, and I said, look, I, I think I need to do experiments. And he just looked at me and said, so what's stopping you? Um, and, um, and, and this really brought home to me the sort of American perspective on, um, on, on life, which is that, you know, if there's something you really want to do, um, the main obstacle is yourself. And for someone like me who had been brought up in, in England and in the European culture and tradition, this was enormously liberating. Um, and, and not only did Mark say this, um, the department that emerged from, uh, that he created, um, really um, uh, allowed it to happen. It was immensely collegial um, and, um, you know, even though I knew this was kind of a ludicrous thing to do, it was even much more difficult than I thought it would be, but I had a huge amount of help from my colleagues and I, it would have been impossible without such a, um, such a unique um, environment to do it in. Um, so that was my kind of start in, in biology. I didn't actually do the experiments myself. I mean, I was expelled from my chemistry lab at school because I broke the glassware. Um, uh, but I managed to persuade very, um, very good postdocs to come to the lab to do it. And I, I and also appreciated that there are doing experiments, actually, that there, there are two sides to it. There's the hands bit um, of actually doing an experiment. And there are people who have amazing hands. They can get reproducible data in conditions that other people can't. And, and then there's the question of deciding, well, what experiment should you do? And that's got nothing to do with hands, it's got to do with the head. And, um, um, and so that was the bit that I, I, you know, I could uh, contribute to what we started to do in the lab. And also in terms of trying to think about what data tells you, because um, that's again, something that you have to sort of think about. Um, and, 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 and people often don't really look at their data, particularly when an experiment fails, whereas I found that sometimes the most revealing data comes from the experiments that don't work. Um, so, so, um, so that was how the lab got started. And then over time, I think um, having sort of basically thrown myself into this, uh, you know, kind of experimental world, um, it gradually became clearer what the sort of real theoretical challenges were that um, lay behind this kind of, you know, public facade of, of, of biology. Um, and, um, and the kinds of experiments we needed to do became more sort of, um, um, you know, sort of elaborate. And, uh, and, and 
um, and and I began to collaborate with experimental groups that were much better equipped to, to do that. And the lab sort of shifted into um, a much more theoretical space. Um, and I think for me, um, that's kind of the questions that uh, really have become the most important um, in the last few years. Um, it's trying to make sense of what it means to do theory in, in, in biology, because um, uh, it is still the case that in biology, um, ideas and concepts come from data and experiments. Um, it's quite unlike the situation that now exists in physics, which Einstein described very, very well in a, in, a, in a comment he made to Heisenberg, that it is theory that tells us what we can observe. Um, and, I, and I think that's a beautiful comment, and I think it reflects Einstein's work on, 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 on um, Brownian motion, which clarified you know, a century's worth of experimental confusion. Um, and and that, tradition ha that transition hasn't taken place in biology yet. And the question is, will it? Is it something special about biology that makes it um, sort of, that it will take a different track? And I think particularly at this time where we see this convergence between immense amounts of data becoming available in biology through sequencing and imaging and other technologies, it's absolutely fabulous what's happening. And also at the same time, you know, machine learning, um, making these amazing advances that we see, uh, you know, every day in our, in our lives now. Um, and that's almost feels like a match made in heaven, you know, data, methods to analyze it, where's, the, where's theory in, in this space? Um, and, and for me, I think trying to, to clarify that has become one of the sort of really important uh, issues. Um, and I feel actually that um, it is precisely because I grew up as a pure mathematician that um, I'm drawn to those kinds of questions and, and feel that they're really important to tackle. So, um, so um, uh, I, I, you know, having, having sort of actually talked this through to you, I, I sort of look at it and say, really, did, was that what happened? I mean, I still, you know, sort of um, can't quite take in how accidental the trajectory was. Um, and, and I think all, all I can say to anyone who's listening is, um, you know, um, do the things that you find interesting and, and life will take you to interesting places. And, and I think that's probably as much as I should probably say. So thank you for listening. Um, thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, what an interesting note to end on. Um, let me uh, let me pick up on a few points you made where um, I have follow up questions. Uh, first, you know, you describe this this journey, this very interesting journey, going from mathematics to computer science to uh, industry to pit stopping at biology and then experiments and then theory. And I wonder, especially given what you said about this tension between pure mathematics and a desire to make a tangible connection with reality, why not physics? <laughs> Did you ever consider physics? Um, physics was just too hard for me. Um, I, I, seriously, I, I always felt that there was something about the way physicists thought, thought about the world that I just didn't have. Um, and it was not that I couldn't follow the mathematics, but it was, it was not to do with that. It was something to do with the way of looking at the world. And, um, and, and it's been very interesting because I think I actually have learned much more physics as a result of, of delving into biology. And I wouldn't say that, you know, I'm a physicist by any means, but I think I've come to, to understand it better. And, and ha I have had a lot of physicists in my lab much more so than I've had mathematicians. And I really love the interaction with them because I think um, um, there's, a, there's a very interesting tension there between the way physicists think about the world and how they, they approach it using mathematics and the way a pure mathematician thinks about the world and approaches it. And that's led to some very interesting kind of fights <laughs> from time to time, but, but actually has been very productive for us in trying to see how to bring those two ways of thinking together. So um, I think your question is a very good one, but I just was never a physicist. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I want to highlight and pick up on the, uh, on the interaction with Mark you described when you were making this transition to be becoming an experimentalist. 
if I remember right, his words to you were, well, what's stopping you? Um, this is, you know, this approach of making bold forays, being a pioneer, um, this is so attractive and so inspiring and yet so antithetical in my experience to the business of doing science. Um, how did you manage? Yeah, um, I, it's, you know, it's a very, that's a very good question. And I, I think, I think I was extremely lucky to have um, just been in the right place at the right time and to have encountered um, people like Mark um, and the people that he nucleated around him in the Department of Systems Biology, Tim Mitchison, Lou Cantley, they were the founding members of the department. Um, and, um, and that kind of boldness was um, something that they uh, exhibited in themselves, in, in their own work, mm -hmm. and in how they encouraged um, and protected um, uh, the people around them to uh, allow them to do um, similar things. Um, I honestly don't think I would have had the guts <laughs> uh, to have um, to have attempted it had that not been um, had that not been there. Um, so so I, I, I do place an enormous um, 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 weight um, on that uh, combination of, of, of people and, and uh, of certain people coming together in a community. And, and I think that is actually that does actually reflect the history of sort of how science um, has worked. I think there have been these periods of time uh, where certain institutions have um, you know, the, the right people have come together and uh, they have been inspired to, you know, uh, break out of the, the sort of walls that typically sort of tend to imprison us either personally or institutionally um, and make, uh, you know, sort of major leaps forward. Um, and I think, you know, you can point to some of the, the, the places where it's happened, you know, um, LMB back in Cambridge in the days of Max Perutz and Francis Crick, um, and, and there, there, are, there are others, um, but, but I, I have to say that um, I think my reading of the history um, of biology, particularly, is that these um, these kind of um, these kinds of periods where there is this ability to take risks and to uh, break open the boundaries of uh, of the confinement that we live in, um, they they are limited in time and space. Um, mm. and, um, and um, uh, you know, they flourish. And then for various reasons, I think often connected with uh, people um, just, you know, getting older, leaving, um, um, uh, their character changes and they sort of fall back into um, the process, you know, institutions, whether they're sort of small groups or actual huge institutions, their major, their major purpose is just to continue their own existence. <laughs> Status quo. Um, uh, and and uh, you know and and so it really needs something unusual to come together where that uh, that is that that uh, that dynamic is broken um, and that um, you know you do something against the current. So wow. I think it's it's luck and circumstance. Wow. Uh, final question, Jeremy. Before I wrap up, um, you described being one of the arguably one of the first people to teach a computer science course <clears throat> who ended up doing biology. Um, I wonder how you feel about what seems to me to be an increasingly alien world uh, threatened to be taken over by large language models <laughs> in this, in this, in this new, new sort of, um, Epoch, um, what do you feel is the role of old fashioned human ingenuity? How do you feel about prediction without understanding or old fashioned understanding? 
Yeah, I, I think that is a very pointed question. I think it's one that I've been um, wrestling with myself and talking to people about. I think in some ways, I would say it's perhaps the most important strategic question that we face as, as scientists um, as we move forward. Um, and it's very interesting because, um, you know, I uh, from my previous life, I know some of the people who um, have uh, are working in this in this new world of machine learning, um, uh, and you know they're they're, they're um, you know uh, many of them are, are wonderful scientists. But um, we have a major disagreement about this matter because um, um, uh, you know I believe I understand things when I can think about molecules bumping into each other, um, and their view is that um, I'm part of the problem. <laughs> and that if only people like me would get out of the way and give them the data, um, there would be nothing left to do. Um, and they're not, um, they're not being facetious. Um, and they have actually good reason uh, to believe this, because if they look back at the history of machine learning, um, how, how did um, uh, uh, visual res recognition systems or speech recognition systems, how were they built originally? They were built by people thinking, well, we have to understand how the human visual process, the system works, and then we'll be able to design computer systems and the same for speech recognition. And it turns out that that's actually, is exactly what doesn't work. And what you need is sufficiently much data and the right kind of machine learning algorithms. And then you don't need to know anything about how it works. And, and chat GPT is a perfect example. It knows zip about language. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the machine learning people, this seems to be an encouragement to come to biology and say, you know, give us the data and get out of the way. Um, and I would say that this is actually, you know, the, the, there's a huge amount of weight and funding and mind space that uh, is moving in this direction. And I think as a theorist, I think that's, a, that's an existential problem. <laughs> but I think the burden is on us um, to um, to um, to articulate why this is inadequate and why we cannot lose sight of the necessity to know what's going on, um, especially in biology. Um, and I think biology is a wonderful place where those two things really have a very strong tension. So I think the battle lines are being drawn. Um, and I think um, this is, uh, you know, for me, this is uh, where uh, the fight has to be has to be taken. And um, I don't think uh, people realize how uh, how critical this is going to be, not just in biology, but I think, uh, as you quite rightly said, um, uh, you know, in a world where, you know, these things are going to be um, intruding into our lives, these these kinds of amazing machine learning methods are going to be intruding into our lives. Um, wow, inspiring, fighting words. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Jeremy, for this very wide ranging discussion and very inspiring living histories talk. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping and closing the recording momentarily.